obviously not a funny topic, but those of you who heard Professor Finkel's um, keynote this morning will find this is kind of a review because obviously the shared interests were touching on much the same thing. Children are metaphors. In any society, in any historical moment, they embody, paradoxically, both promise and menace. Not at all remarkably, nations striving to define their place in the increasingly chaotic modern world of the early 20th century were quick to cast children as emblems of the future. And also not surprisingly, the young, unformed, self-consciously striving nation that was Canada at the time was quick to seize on the metaphoric child as emblematic of its future maturity with all its positive implications. For all the rhetoric about ideal children in an ideal world, in an ideal future Canada, Canadians who were as concerned about the present had to confront the enormous problem of child welfare if there would be any hope for any such future. My title, These Little Ones, refers to an article in the journal Social Welfare, which was the official organ of the Social Service Council of Canada later in conjunction with the Canadian Association of Social Workers. It suggests the concern and compassion that the journal's contributors and readers, many of whom were social activists, voluntar voluntarily or accredited social workers, um, held regarding the plight of the many Canadian children living in poverty and want. It also reflects the new public attention to what many considered the principal social problem of the day child welfare. This broadening interest was encouraged by a flourishing international campaign whose leaders, both volunteer child welfare activists and professionals in education, medicine, psychology and social work, confidently proclaimed the 20th century, still young and hopeful itself, to be the century of the child. The early child welfare movement, which in Canada had already accomplished a few of its objectives in child rescue and protection during the late 19th century, drew from a number of emergent ideas that changed both public perspectives on children and on poverty itself. By the beginning of the 20th century, a new view of childhood as a special time of life and children themselves as special, innocent, vulnerable, in need of protection, overcame historic views of children as inherently evil, born with what they call the old Adam still in them, mortal sin in short, and in need of harsh, even physical, discipline and punishment to make them conform to prevailing values. For the children of the poor, I want to show you a slide. Okay, these are. This is a, a portrait by the famous 19th century, early 20th century photographer <coughs> William Naughton of Montreal. He did all the portraits, for, formal portraits, of course, because they didn't do candid photography in those days of the rich and famous of the city and elsewhere. So these are um, Mr. Morris and Molson, and you can tell just by the simple fact that they had a portrait done by Naughton and the way they dress and the toys that they are posed with and so on, that they are supposed to be, or that they could very well represent what Victorians felt were ideal children. Um, I like to think of them as the uh, scions of beer and cigarettes, because that, that's how their uh, parents made the money. The reality, however, was that this ideal childhood was very much class, race, class and racially defined. These people could have an ideal childhood. For most kids, no, that's not going on either. Most kids had lives like, like this little boy, anonymous pit boy, working in the coal, bread, and cave mine, um, coal mines, probably 10 years old, maybe 12. And other children, such as the, it, this, this too is a, it was a newspaper shot done of uh, an exhausted newsboy, it's called. In, in some, I, what I am quite simply trying to show you here with these, uh, these photographs is that the ideal childhood, for all that it was a big deal 
afford, it was very much a middle class thing. Those who could afford it could have medical childhood insurance. The rest worked for wages as soon as they could be sent out to do so. That was the common experience of a working class poor children. Child, the the uh, attention to a new childhood prompted and was reinforced by early 20th century beginnings of child development studies and consequent attempts in what was supposed to be a modern scientific age to integrate its findings into parenting, schooling, and medical care. Children were bundles of potential, symbols of an ideal future, and had to be nurtured and safeguarded accordingly. The child welfare campaigns of this period owed their inspiration in many ways to the concurrent social gospel reform campaign. A movement of progressive reform grounded in an activist Christianity, the social gospel was intended to make the church socially relevant by taking its precepts, quite literally, into the streets. In order to address the worst abuses of industrialization, urbanization, and immigration, what, which was also becoming one of the vast catalog of problems that they saw around them. Its many crusades, all under the rubric of moral and social reform, focused on such matters as public health, sanitation, slum clearance, clean water and milk, school inspection, community services for the immigrants born into the country. The idea was to remedy the problems without disrupting the capitalist system in which they, the people who wanted to remedy the problems, were quite comfortably situated. Now, without dismissing their genuine Christian motivation, because this was a profoundly Christian society, there was a large measure of self, or at least class preservation, involved in the participation and leadership of considerable numbers of white, Anglo-Celtic, Protestant, urban, middle class, and professional men, although with growing numbers of women who much resemble the background of men, obviously. These women were not looking for radical change either. They sought to extend the traditional, biologically determined role as wives, housekeepers, and mothers into the public sphere, and even employed the domestic language of sweeping away, cleaning up, and scrubbing out the evils that men did, especially in the cause of children, their true vocation. They ultimately supported suffrage on the basis of this maternal feminism to emphasize these innate womanly qualifications. The vote would empower them to accomplish so much more without relying on male politicians to do so. These spreading social reform campaigns also came up against the inability of this group of private citizens and volunteers to act effectively in the name of social welfare. The problem was such and ever growing that only the state was actually, they recognized, was fully equipped to do so. For the better part of colonial history, that is pre-confederation, social welfare was premised on a simple two-category model. The poor were either deserving or undeserving. This moral judgment meant that the undeserving, whose poverty was due to flaws in personal morality, indifference to work, Habits such as drinking and gambling, lack of thrift, overall shiftlessness. These were, uh, these were the largely male um, and often racialized as well. Those who were considered deserving were the impoverished, those who were impoverished due to no fault of their own. These were largely female, widowed and deserted mothers, or the wives of irresponsible breadwinners who came to suffering along with their children because of their, the breadwinner's inability to perform the rightful manly role. Women at this time were truly only a man away from poverty, which made children equally vulnerable, and even more so because of age. Consequently, late 19th and early 20th century welfare initiatives targeted the needs of poor women and children first. But this did not make them entitled to public assistance either, for all their deserving classification. It simply placed them at the front of the line where philanthropy and volunteerist programs were concerned. That is, as I said, until it was recognized that the problem was simply too big. So under the uh, so-called residual welfare system of the 19th century, 
People were supposed to fend for themselves and turn to family and church and perhaps the larger community in order to get by. The main thing was to get them back to work as quickly as possible. If they could not or would not work, there was the only public relief available had to make things worse for them or be worse for them in terms of living conditions and so on than the lowliest possible job. So public welfare at the time, public assistance, had um, a, a very humiliating and punitive aspect to it. For all that it was recognized, the, the, the cartoon over here, which you can't see very well, um, the poor mother and infant, literally at the steps of a mansion where the people in that window there are enjoying probably fine dining or whatever it is to reach through with the poor stumbling on their front door. Um, the other one is a, 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 a sketch of distribution of food to the Georgia Society. Again, a private, charitable society um, supported by the Anglican Church because most of them were church affiliated. And this is the best that they could do unless they were willing to give up absolutely all claim to any of their standard human rights and turn themselves into, surrender themselves to becoming inmates of the poorhouse. This is uh, the uh, Wellington County House of Industry. They were so named because the poor needed to be reminded that it was their lack of industry that had put them there in the first place. Again, this was not in any way a welcoming institution. It basically put shelter over their heads and some minimal food in their mouths, and so it was better than the streets. But at the same time, it made things as difficult as possible. Families were split up. Children were, um, everyone had to work in some capacity. Uh, children were frequently indentured out to farm families to help with agricultural labor without their parents' permission or their parents knowing it because, in effect, the parents, if they were in the workhouse with the children, and usually they were, um, had relinquished their rights to those children and they became wards of the, uh, the house of industry, so to speak. The only other uh, institutions that were available to poor children were, of course, the orphanages. They, too, were mostly run by church-affiliated and charitable organizations. The Protestant Women's League, for example, was a really big one, and then, of course, there were very many Catholic orphanages and so on. The, the important point about those orphanages is that a great many of the children in there were not even orphans. They were placed there, and again, we refer back to uh, Tom Campbell's uh, story, they were placed there temporarily by parents, usually single mothers, who hoped to retrieve them at some better point. Often they could not ever retrieve them. But they were, in effect, uh, the only available daycare or boarding house for a lot of poor children. And of course, many of these children, as I mentioned, were surrendered by single mothers who could not provide for them on the scant wages that women earned in those times. And more than a century later, the largest proportion of Canadian families living in poverty are still those headed by single mothers. What of indigenous children, truly the first children of the land? While the BNA Act relegated public health and welfare concerns to the provinces, the 1876 Indian Act made First Nations wards of the federal government. From the beginning, consequently, health and welfare were separate and far from equal, and they were created that way. Although the health of Indigenous women and children was by far the most threatened of any social group, as it remains, the so-called Indians were subjected to a neglect far from benign, as witness in deliberate withholding of food rations in a time of starvation, as occurred on the prairies during the 1880s and 90s, scarcity of medical assistance, and, of course, the ongoing multi-generational horrors of the residential schools. For First Nations children, child welfare, in effect, well, for First Nations children, the residential schools established by the 1870s and continuing for about a century afterward were the federal government's answer to matters of health and welfare. 
The schools increasingly function as orphanages and child welfare facilities rather than places of education as much as they had ever been there. By 1950, the federal government estimated that some 50% of children in residential schools were there for child welfare reasons. They had been removed from their homes for, for those reasons. And tragically, many of the reasons that return the or that place them in these schools as a respite from home and family came out of the schools themselves. Again, there's that intergenerational circle of trauma that continues. I couldn't help but show this one because it says so much in just a few numbers. What were some of the particular welfare concerns then of early 20th century reformers that quickly became part of the child welfare campaign? There's, I mean, child welfare and the larger social welfare campaigns are inextricable, of course. First was the worsening urban ghettos that contain the poor, especially immigrants, um, and so affected the health of everyone living there, but predominantly infants and children, a sure indicator of family poverty. Another sure indicator of family poverty was the persistence of child labor. This is the ward in Toronto. And right behind the ward, you see the old Toronto um, City Hall, newly built, $15 million, proudly the most expensive piece of civic architecture in North America. And right in front of it, we have this going on. And homeless families sleeping in the streets. I believe this one's from America. Another of the persistent indicators of poverty, or sorry, another of the indicators of poverty was the persistence of child labor, despite all middle class ideals concerning a protected independent childhood. And more importantly, despite the protective legislation passed in most provinces during the late 19th century that prohibited employment in factories and mines to girls under 12 and boys under 14. But the new laws that pushed younger children out of dangerous factories and mines were double-edged. Family need meant that they had to be even more resourceful in order to earn their keep. The laws literally pushed them onto the streets. Many, boys in particular, took up the street trades, which often meant even longer hours and lower earnings and, of course, greater exposure to the dangers of the street, especially the moral dangers that particularly troubled the child welfare activists. More attention in the early 20th century was also being paid to the somewhat problematic statistics being reported by provincial health departments indicating that infant mortality rates were shockingly high. The night visitor there is pulling off a baby and that again is supposed to be a reflection on the high infant mortality. Um, Montreal, again, the statistics are really problematic because birth registration wasn't even required by law until 1921 or so. Uh, Montreal was reputedly, uh, had the, the highest rates of infant mortality outside of Calcutta, India. Um, as so they said at the time, they, people weren't very aware of this, but again, the issue was how to address it, and a large part of the answer to that became maternal education. Nonetheless, Something like one in five babies in 1900 died before their first birthdays. More than a quarter of those, it is estimated, due to poverty and malnutrition, both pre- and postnatal. These numbers were taken as evidence of the precarity in which the industrial working class and the recently arrived were obliged to live. They prompted stronger commitments to child welfare, beginning from infancy. When maternal mortality was recognized as a serious problem in itself, in 1920, 1,500 mothers and 100,000 died giving birth. Calls were made for prenatal supervision as well. The fact that the largest majority of the poor could not afford medical assistance, even at childbirth, inspired the creation of pure milk depots for poor women and soon afterward, well baby clinics and visiting nurse services, all of which were meant to be purely diagnostic and education. They would have a look at the baby, um, talk to the mother about some things that she could do in order to ensure its health, but there was nothing in terms of treatment and that was what they most needed. Socialized medicine, of course, would wait until the 1960s. 
These statistics are actually from 1921 when we first had stats, but I point out to you as well, 2016, the last uh, statistics available, the infant mortality rate in Canada was by then 4.9 in a thousand. I think we're number three in the hierarchy. We're ahead of the United States, put it that way. First Nations, on reserve, it is 11 per 1,000. One, it's more than twice as much as the rate for non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. And apparently for um, uh, First Nations off reserve, the rate is not much different for, than it is for uh, everyone else. It's on reserve that the blue issue means. For the Inuit, 19 out of 1,000, which is truly shocking. And, you know, there are studies going on and all kinds of other things. A lot of it has to do with malnutrition, and a lot of which has to do with poverty and deprivation. It's all there is to it. There's a lot of talking about poverty as a, as a social evil that needed to be remedied by those who not only um, fared better due to their class position, but knew better, according to their own point of view, as you know, superior white Anglo-Celtic types with more education and so on, but a real failure consistently to address poverty itself. As I mentioned earlier, women were increasingly involved in social gospel campaigns, increasingly organizing and taking up active parts in the public sphere. By the 1920s, women's organizations had expanded far beyond a handful of local councils and church auxiliaries to encompass a vast network of women's groups with various affiliations. Not new women. They eschewed involvement in politics for the most part, including the suffrage movement. The most important of these was the National Council of Women of Canada, which was formed by the Governor General's wife, Lady Edgerton. And again, they used the biological argument that women were innately equipped as women to clean up society. And so we see things like this. Manitoba was the first to give the vote to women, which it did in 1916, with the remaining provinces following suit shortly thereafter, except for Quebec, which didn't give them the vote until 1940. Of course, the, the suffrage came, full suffrage, in 1918. <coughs> the first social service established to address the specific problem of neglected, abused, and abandoned children was the Toronto Children's Aid Society, founded in 1891. The CAS was headed by reform activist and journalist John Joseph Kelso. Kelso had known poverty growing up in Toronto. As a reporter on The Beat, and later a Globe editor, he also knew firsthand, had seen firsthand, the hardships faced by poor children. He became determined to create a social safety net that would protect them. Every province quickly established its own children's aid society on the Toronto model. Shortly after its establishment in 1893, Kelsey was appointed by the provincial government to be superintendent for dependent and neglected children, an entirely new position. And he was handed the responsibility of administering the Act for the Prevention of Cruelty to and Better Protection of Children, passed largely due to the initiatives of Kelso and other like-minded child welfare reformers in, 19, in 1893. This Act officially authorized the transfer of guardianship from parents to the CAS. The belief in forming child welfare work in this time was that children fared better in a family setting. And so the move was, it was the move made away from institutions to foster care. Prior to Kelso's reforms, there were no official child welfare programs. He was also one of the leading supporters of the urban mission or settlement house movements that progressive reformers in the U.S. and Great Britain were already using to positive effect. Professor Finkel already mentioned uh, Jane Addams Hall House in Chicago, which she personally visited, as many of them did, to have a stronger idea of how to structure these things. Another of the social gospel approaches to the problem of poor families then was, uh, and to children in particular, was the establishment of missions or settlement houses in the worst urban centers. Those populated largely by the recently arrived the so-called foreigners. While, again, we needn't doubt the sincerity of their concern for the poor, the social gospelers definitely espouse racist and eugenicist ideas about the immigrants settled in the worst urban slums. The key to their salvation 
was not the provision of necessary services in and of themselves to meet the acknowledged need, but the provision of services specifically designed to deliver the message of Anglo-Protestant superiority, the true basis of communionism. The missions and settlements offered services that included direct charity work, basic English language and literacy instruction, courses in health and hygiene, and child care, maternal education, cooking, nutrition, all of them, of course, in, in accordance with middle class standards of domesticity, and many of them quite simply out of the reach of the working poor, you know, even if they very much wanted to espouse them. This is one of the leading social gospel um, ministers of the time, uh, James Shaver Wordsworth. He was a Methodist minister, and the Methodist church was the most involved in the social welfare campaigns at the time. Social gospel leader, he was a founder of the first tribunals for social welfare in Canada. 1907 was the Moral and Social Reform Con Council of Canada. They dropped the moral from the name, it went through all kinds of other things, but they never lost sight of the moral basis of what they wanted to do with these people. And he, he later uh, became a founder of the Progressive Party, which also grew out of social gospel, and a member of parliament, and he, he was one of the founders of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation in 1935, the CCF, which in this day is the New Democratic Party, or NDP. So, like many of them, I'm only showing you this, because like J.J. Kelso and many others, he wore very many hats. The reformers were never involved in one specific campaign, because they're inextricable. Fundamentally, social welfare is about child welfare. And we can, we can make a lot of arguments in the same way. And social welfare is about social justice. So, there was a lot of... Uh, of uh, a lot of cross-fertilization, we can say, between the various groups, and they even shared some of the same people. There's just a, this is a photo of uh, children of the mission. There. You see that the women, <laughs> there are women taking care of them. The missions and settlement houses increasingly were, um, were run, directed by, the programs were directed by women. And this became a, a step for many of them into professional social work. The University of Toronto established its first social work program in 1914 and McGill University in 1918. U of T actually had several settlement houses in, the, in Toronto, the most famous of which was Central Neighborhood House, which is right here. This isn't the first house, apparently, but I think it's the second of the great many. Still in existence, still serves as a community center. And again, this is a knitting class because they were certainly attempting to train girls to become the you know, gender appropriate ideal woman, they had cooking classes and those kind of things too, and little mother's classes. And finally, these settlement houses often became um, public health clinics of a sort. I mentioned the little baby clinics before. Here, you know, the babies of the poor could be brought, weighed, measured, and advised upon, or their mothers could be advised upon in terms of how to take care of them. If they were sick, they had to uh, take themselves to Sick Children's Hospital to their um, outpatient clinic, which did charitable work, but you can only imagine the lineups. For the poor, medical care was last resort, and often called too late to make any difference in their children's health. The settlement workers lived on site in the settlements, and while sharing, stressing their position as members or neighbors in the community, they organized activities such as these that targeted the acquisition of, again, those class-based, gender, racial um, values that were part of their particular outlook, their particular culture, in short, whatever the culture of the people on the receiving end might be. <clears throat> and we come to the Great War, again, a major turning point for social welfare. Women and children very quickly became a, a huge part of the war effort on the home front because, of course, there were more young men, more young married men and fathers of young children than ever before in history who were now gone off to, to fight 
for the Asian Empire. Despite the fact that the soldiers had allowances, they took a long time to get to their families, and they were just not enough. 